Our bishops face an increasing call to counsel members with problems that have more to do with emotional needs than with the need for food or clothing or shelter. My message, therefore, is to the subject solving emotional problems in the Lord's own way. Fortunately, the principles of temporal welfare apply to emotional problems as well. When the Church was two years old, the Lord revealed that the idler shall not have place in the Church except he repent and mend his ways. The Welfare Handbook instructs, We must earnestly teach and urge our members to be self-sustaining to the fullest extent of their power. No Latter-day Saint will voluntarily shift from himself the burden of his own support. We have succeeded fairly well in teaching Latter-day Saints that they should take care of their own material needs and then contribute to the welfare of others. If he is unable to sustain himself, then he is to call upon his own family, then upon the Church in that order, and not upon the government at all. We have counseled bishops and stake presidents to be very careful to avoid all any abuse of the welfare program. When people are able but unwilling to care for themselves, we are responsible to employ the dictum of the Lord that the idler shall not eat the bread of the laborer. When the first Church welfare program was announced, the First Presidency said, Our primary purpose was to set up, insofar as possible, a system under which the curse of idleness would be done away with, the evils of the dole abolished, and independence, industry, thrift, and self-respect be once more established amongst our people. The aim of the Church is to help people to help themselves. Occasionally someone is attracted to the Church because of our welfare program. They see material security. Our answer to them is, yes, join the Church for that reason. We can use all of the help we can get. You will be called upon continually to help and to bless others. It is a self-help system, not a quick handout system. It requires a careful inventory of all personal and family resources, all of which must be called upon before anything is added from the outside. It is not an unkind or an unfeeling bishop who requires a member of the Church to work to the fullest extent he can for what he receives from Church welfare. There should not be the slightest embarrassment for any member to be assisted by the Church provided, that is, that he has contributed all that he can. President Romney has emphasized to care for people on any other basis is to do them more harm than good. The purpose of Church welfare is not to relieve a member from taking care of himself. The principle of self-reliance or independence is fundamental to the happy life. In too many places, in too many ways, we are getting away from it. The substance of what I want to say is this. <clears throat> that same principle, self-reliance, has application to the spiritual and to the emotional. We have been taught to store a year's supply of food, clothing, and if possible, sh fuel, at home. There has been no attempt to set up a storeroom in every chapel. We know that in the crunch, our members may not be able to get to the chapel for supplies. Can we not see that that same principle applies to inspiration and revelation, to counsel and to guidance? We need to have a source of it stored in every home, not just in the bishop's office. If we do not do that, we are quite as threatened spiritually as we should be were we to assume that the Church should supply every material need. Unless we use care, we are on the verge of doing to ourselves emotionally and therefore spiritually what we have been working so hard for generations to avoid materially. We seem to be developing an epidemic of counselitis. It drains spiritual strength from the Church. 
Much like the common cold drains more strength from humanity than any other disease. That is very serious. There are many chronic cases. Individuals who endlessly seek counsel but do not follow the counsel that is given. On one hand, we counsel bishops to avoid abuses in welfare help. On the other hand, some bishops dole out counsel and advice without considering that the member should solve the problem himself. Speaking figuratively, many a bishop keeps on the corner of his desk a large stack of emotional order forms. When someone comes with a problem, the bishop unfortunately doles them out without thinking what he is doing to his people. We have become very anxious over the amount of counseling that we seem to need in the church. Our members are becoming dependent. We must not set up a network of counseling services without emphasizing at the same time the principle of emotional self-reliance and individual independence. If we lose our emotional and spiritual independence, our self-reliance, we can be weakened quite as much, perhaps even more, than when we become dependent materially. If we are not careful, we will lose the power of individual revelation. What the Lord said to Oliver Cowdery has great meaning for all of us. Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you will feel that it is right. But if it be not right, you shall have no such feelings, but shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget the thing that is wrong. Spiritual independence and self-reliance is a sustaining power in the church. If we rob our members of that, how can they get revelation for themselves? How will they know that there is a prophet of God? How can they get answers to prayers? Or how can they know for sure themselves? It is not an unfeeling bishop who requires those coming to him for counsel to exhaust every personal and every family resource before helping them. Bishops, be careful with your emotional order forms. Do not pass them out without having analyzed carefully the individual resources. Teach our members to follow proper channels in solving problems. It is not unusual for some to shop around to get advice from neighbors, friends from every direction, and then choose what they think is the best of it. That is a mistake. Some want to start with professional counselors, with psychologists, or go directly to the general authorities to begin with. The problems may need that kind of attention, but only after every personal and every family and every local resource has been exhausted. We mentioned that when a member has used all of his own resources, there should be no embarrassment in receiving welfare assistance. That principle holds true with emotional assistance as well. There may be a time when a deep-seated emotional problem needs more than can be given by the family or the bishop or the stake president. In order to help with the very difficult problems, the Church has established some counseling services. Those are in areas where our membership is large, but they are only for those who come through proper channels. The first category includes those services that ordinarily require a license. The licensed services include adoptions, the care of unwed mothers, the foster care of children, the Indian placement program. The First Presidency has issued a letter giving instruction and caution with reference to these licensed services. Our purpose here will be to describe the clinical services. Clinical services are offered, again through proper channels only, in three successive steps. First, consultation. 
where a priesthood leader consults with an LDS social services representative about a serious problem. Only the priesthood leader meets with social services. The next step, evaluation, wherein a bishop and a member meet with social services to evaluate the problem. Ordinarily, this is one meeting only. Thereafter, the bishop continues to help the member. In difficult and persistent cases, there is therapy. The member, and when possible, the bishop, meets with a social service practitioner for counseling. After that, the bishop gives continuing help. Bishops and state presidents can exemplify self-reliance by resolving these problems locally. Ultimately, it is the member who must solve them. Bishops, you must not abdicate your responsibility to anyone, not to professionals, even to those employed by church social services. They would be the first to tell you so. You have a power to soothe and to sanctify and to heal that others do not have. Sometimes what a member needs is forgiveness, and you, Bishop, have a key to that. If you find a case where professional help is justified, be careful. There are some spiritually destructive techniques used in the field of counseling. When you entrust a member to others, do not let them be subjected to those things. Solve these problems in the Lord's way. Some counselors want to delve deeper than is emotionally or spiritually healthy. They sometimes want to draw out and analyze and take apart and dissect. Now, while a certain amount of catharsis may be healthy, over much of it can be degenerating it is seldom as easy to put something back together as it is to take it apart. By probing too deeply or endlessly talking about problems, we can foolishly cause the very things we are trying to prevent. You probably know about the parents who said, now children, while we are gone, don't take the stool into the pantry and climb up to the second shelf and move the cracker box and get that sack of beans and put one up your nose, will you? <laughs> there is a lesson in that. Now, Bishop, you may ask justifiably, how in the world can I ever accomplish my job as bishop and still counsel those who really need it? One stake president said to me, bishops don't have time to counsel. With the load we're putting on them, we're killing our bishops off. While there's some truth in that, I sometimes think it's a case of suicide. <laughs> our, our study indicates that it is usually in program administration with all of the meetings, training sessions, and so on, the activities that the bishop spends too much time. Bishops, leave that to your counselors, to priesthood leaders, and to auxiliary leaders. Trust them. Let go of it, and you will then be free to do the thing that will make the most difference, counseling those who really need it in the Lord's own way. Recently, two letters have gone to the field. The one was a two-thirds reduction in the number of personal priesthood interviews required at all levels. The other was a major shifting of administrative meetings from weekly and monthly to monthly and quarterly. And we have every hope that other relief will be filtering down through channels. In the meantime, Bishop, you are in charge. Get the administrative and training part of your work in such efficient operations. Delegate it so that you will have time to counsel your people. Bishops keep constantly in mind that fathers are responsible to preside over their families. Sometimes, with all good intentions, we require so much of both the children and of the father that he is not able to do so. If my boy needs counseling, Bishop, it should be my responsibility first and yours second. If my boy needs recreation, Bishop, I should provide it first and you second. 
If my boy needs correction, that should be my responsibility first and yours second. If I am failing as a father, help me first and my family second. Do not be too quick to take over from me the job of raising my children. Do not be too quick to counsel them and solve all the problems. Get me involved. It is my ministry. We live in a day when the adversary stresses on every hand the philosophy of instant gratification. We seem to demand instant everything, including instant solutions to our problems. We are indoctrinated that somehow we should always be instantly, emotionally comfortable. When that is not so, some become anxious and all too frequently seek relief from overmuch counseling, from analysis, even from medication. It was meant to be that life would be a challenge, to suffer some anxiety, some depression, some disappointment, even some failure is normal. Teach our members that if they have a good miserable day once in a while or several in a row, to stand steady and face them. Things will straighten out. There is purpose in struggle in life. There's meaning in these words entitled, The Lesson. Yes, my fretting, frowning child, I could cross the room to you more easily but I've already learned to walk, so I make you come to me. Let go now there. You see? Oh, remember this simple lesson, child. And when in later years you cry out with tight fists and tears, Oh, help me, God, please, just listen. And you'll hear a silent voice. I would, child, I would. But it's you, not I who needs to try Godhood. Bishop, those who come to you are children of God. Counsel them in the Lord's own way. Teach them to ponder in their minds, then to pray over their problems. Remember that soothing, calming effect of reading the scriptures. And now a closing thought from the scriptures. The prophet Alma, faced a weightier problem than you, Bishop, will likely see in your ministry. Like you, he felt uncertain and went to Mosiah. Mosiah wisely turned the problem back to him, saying, Behold, I judge them not, therefore I deliver them into thy hands to be judged. And now the spirit of Alma was again troubled, and he went and inquired of the Lord, what he should do concerning this matter, for he feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God. And it came to pass that after he had poured out his whole soul to God, the voice of the Lord came to him. That voice will speak to you, Bishop. That is your privilege. I bear witness of that. For I know that he lives. May God bless you, Bishop, the inspired judge in Israel, and those who come to you as you counsel them in the Lord's own way. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.